Welcome to the Experimental Mathematics uh, Seminar. Today's speaker is Dr. Jairam Swami from Kent State Department of Finance, who will speak about discrepancy between Black Scholes and binomial ocean premia. As usual, with the speaker out of town, we're going to uh, take uh, Jay out for dinner at 6.45 at the usual place, at the Evelyn restaurant uh, in New Brunswick. If you'd like to join us, please let me know immediately after the talk. Thank you. Okay, Jay. Uh, thank you, Daron, for inviting me. First, I would like to start by giving the genesis of this paper, because about two years ago, I came to know that a person had written a paper <coughs> called Phil Maimin, who's a professor at NYU. And he, the paper was entitled, Markets are Efficient If and Only If NP Equals to P. Mm -hmm. And that was incredible, because for the first time, they combined two oceans of knowledge, computer science and finance. I had my PhD in Chicago under Pharma, who invented efficient markets. And I always wanted to tell him that, not yet, Gene, not yet. Mm -hmm. So NP Equals to P was written as a taunting reminder that Markets couldn't possibly be efficient. So I, I resigned the challenge, one day I'll prove it. Mm -hmm. And Phil and I created a new journal, which I wanted to show around. And in this first journal, uh, this is uh, the second uh, uh, version. The, in, the, in the first original paper, there was a paper by a guy called Evangelos, who wrote a paper called Close Form Binomial Pricing of Options. Uh, does not exist. And about a year and a half ago, I came to know about this paper, and I immediately told Phil, we should have it in the, in the journal. And I said, I would like to have the results checked, and we sent it to Doron through Phil. And when Doron confirmed the results were right, I said, boy, you know, for 30 years we've been thinking wrongly. Because when the doron uh, zeilberger wilf theorem came out, that certain forms didn't converge, I immediately thought that anybody who could apply it to option pricing would possibly make a big stir because for 30 years after the Black Scholes model was released, and most of you might know the Black Scholes model, it won the Nobel Prize in 1997 because um, it was the first one to use Ito's lemma, a uh, continuous time formulation. And so, what I would like to just basically allude to, since most of you are not from finance, is to say that. The way that it was set up was that a call option based on a stock price X, strike price X, T for time to expiration, R for the risk-free rate, and sigma for the volatility, is S and D1 minus XE minus RT and D2. And this was a breakthrough that Black and Scholes had. And D1, D is the incomplete normal uh, distribution, so everybody knows what this is. Um, which, of course, in the book A to equals to B, you make a big deal about this, not having a primitive and all that. So we, we know how difficult it, it is to uh, tabulate. And D1 equals the log of the ratio of the stock, the strike, plus R plus sigma squared over 2 times T over sigma root T, and D2 equals to D1 minus sigma root T. Now, this was a heralded with much fanfare, because the day they got it, it meant that the pricing of options was no longer a mysterious thing. But it was couched in continuous time, so because of the use of stochastic calculus to expand the function for a riskless hedge, few MBAs could understand it. Even computer science students, I find that you have to push them really hard. But in finance, the MBAs couldn't handle it. So uh, six years later, Cox, Ross, Rubinstein came out with the lattice. The lattice was that you take a binomial tree and you pushed it to a multi-state space model, each one recombining by itself. So up, down equals to down, up. That forms a reversibility closure. In the limit, you would get the pullback function of the call as equivalent to uh, a very, it's a very complicated expression, so I'm going to try to avoid getting into it. Uh, you see on the blackboard that function there. And people had assumed that this part here, sum of i equals to 0 to n, n choose i, e to the i, 
1 minus p n minus i. This one is something that people in high school, no? Maybe in this country in first year uni, but in India and China it's definitely eighth grade material. You know? I remember we were told to learn this thing. Although of course we had it in a much more simpler form of 1 plus uh, p to the n, and that was to be expanded. Now, what was interesting about this model? No, it's p plus 1 minus p. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. P and 1 minus p. So it's 1. Huh? It's 1 to the power n. This is 1. Uh, it's, it's, sorry, sorry. Uh, p to the n, n minus. Uh, no, it's n. right. But yeah. it's equal to 1, the whole thing. Right, 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 right. So here is right, right. p plus 1 minus p. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, in, in this line. This uh, is right, but it's not 1 plus p to the power n. Yeah, actually, it's it's it must be. It must be in the, in the, more, in the more general sense. Yeah, side. sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but high school kids had learned this. And so the beauty of the model was that Cox, Ross, Rubinstein, three big names in finance, said that this could, this is the only thing that needed to be known. It must be the end, the expansion of it, which we learned in high school. And so because the fact that it was elementary, compared to this one, which is not elementary because it was based on Ito's lemma, it came to pass that they had a very important limit, which is the price of option is the number of path counts that you can do on one, one direction, for example, you, you could be this path, okay, whatever. And this was the combinatorial uh, number you hit it with to count the number of paths of like that. And then they tried to put in max of zero and the value of the stock under those conditions, which is p to the i, one minus p to n minus i. Actually, I'm getting this somewhat wrong. I think it's a and b, but, but uh, never mind, uh, up and down. Up and down, yeah, right, that's it. Okay, so basically it's up and down rather than P1 minus P. Different uh, authors use different nomenclature. But they had the max function there and zero. The, the, the idea here is that if you saturate the state space with this function, which is the payoff of the option, then if the option is out the money, it's zero, and in the money is this thing here. Now, what this guy Evangelos did was he used the Zellberger Wolf theorem to show that the moment you collaborate with the payoff, is no longer hypergeometric. That never occurred to me. I always wondered how this was done. In fact, we used to make a joke. How do you get rid of the non-differentiable max function here? And the joke was, you get smart, you know? You know, you max, max you max and get smart. <laughs> Some of you think it's but funny, but I, that was the best I could do to humor the MBA students. So you get rid of max by getting smart. How do you get smart? You count the number of lattice paths at which is in the money, and Cox, Ross, Robinstein said that there existed a certain number such that S, if you have a sufficient number of ups, call it uh, U star, and a sufficient number of downs, uh, well, this, this will be tied to U, of course, so you don't have to have the star there, N minus I. If this exceeded the strike price, it was in the money and you could knock this out. So they only had to sum between the number of ups and downs so you, you could isolate a number, a special number, by solving this equation for the unknown uh, u star by taking logs. And this then got rid of max. When you got rid of max, you were left with expressions that were hypergeometric and non-hypergeometric. And by hand-waving, um, Cox, Ross, Rubinstein then showed that in the passage to the limit as n goes to infinity, this converges to black shows. Now for 25 years, I believed that. Until Ivanov showed that there is no closed form solution. And it intrigued me because for 25 years, we, we never actually thought that this thing couldn't actually uh, converge. It, this thing actually had no closed form. So I researched the term, what it means to have no closed form. And it dawned on me that in the last three years, some new things have come to bear. That unlike the central limit theorem, where you assume a sample of size 30 is enough for the central limit theorem to kick in. Uh, here, it was assumed that as n goes large, the thing would go away. It doesn't go away. The lack of a closed form means something serious. It means that it might never ever converge. So I remember that six years ago, I'd been toying with the Riemann hypothesis, a topic that I told Doron I, I would uh, not bring up today. And I had reason to want to test the zeta function for infinitely precise values. So I invoked an infinite precision package. I, I bought it from a guy 
There was 36,000 lines of Fortran code, you know, to get an arbitrary precision. And there has been a lot of books written, as you computer scientists people know, error-free computing is called. And I knew a lot about the infinite precision. Whereas in finance, they only had to account a 16-digit uh, precision. I said, why don't we push it all the way to 220 digits? By the way, a small joke here. I like to tell a few jokes here and there. Mm -hmm. Bill Gates has a 256-bit in encryptor in his home in Seattle. If you can break him, he welcomes you and he gives you a job. <laughs> Unlike third world countries where they'll cut your head off, no? Yeah. Here they give you a job, like cash me if you can, right? Yeah. So go for it. <laughs> but unlike the case of uh, quadruple precision, nobody had assumed that the thing wouldn't converge. And I then wanted to very badly to meet Doron, because I said I got to meet this guy who created this theorem. So Phil and I drove down and met him in Princeton, and we had a long dinner. And you know, Doron, I'm a jack of all trades. I do math, I do statistics, I do finance, I do music, everything. Mm -hmm. But this one here caught my eye because I felt that with infinite precision, the truth could be known about how quickly it converges. And for the record, I knew that in the central limit theorem's case, the famous Barry Essien problem says that uh, things don't actually converge. You can't approximate a discrete random variable by chopping off the function. It's like a loss, lossy function. In JPEG, MPEG compression, you get a problem, you know? So if you repeatedly hit it with the operator, you lose something every time. Well, with infinite precision, you would know the truth. So what I did was I told my PhD student, why don't you learn the R, R language and try to get it uh, tested on infinite precision? So Tom Hansen, who, who, who in my, my mind is the best that one can hope for a PhD student, he is the kind of person that uh, you long to have. He, he got into the Juliet School. He, he plays the piano like like a genius. And he um, actually also got an Harvard. Why he came to Kent is a mystery to me. But he came to Kent and I took him off the, his arms. And so he decided, okay, we'll, we'll go for the, the full uh, enchilada test of this thing to see whether the Zeilberger result, it doesn't converge holes. Because I'd heard that it does converge by some hand-waving uh, argument that was never made rigorous that a binomial lattice would not converge to its continuous time, log normal distribution, had not been tested. So first we chose to have 128-bit uh, precision. And one of my former advisors, who's a big wig in this area, George Constantini, said, Jay, you have to go to 10,000 time steps. That means you've got to push N to 10,000. When he went to about 6,000, the code crashed because no computer could cope with it. So we had to vectorize the code. After doing all that, we managed to get 10,000 and still no convergence. So we felt that, ha, huh, this has been picked up on. It turns out that some authors had picked up on it, like Dai, Liu, and Layson. I mean, so some people have, in the last three, four years, picked up on the fact that the convergence is very slow. And recently, I got an email from Giovanni Peroni Desi, who had priced the American option, that convergence was a problem. But they always assume at some high enough level of N, asymptopia as they call it, it would converge. Well, the bad news is it doesn't. And why? Because a certain hypergeometric condition, the ratio of two rational functions, is not satisfied. Why? Because you're hitting the operator, which is the binomial is hypergeometric as entirety. Although if you slice off parts of it, it's not hypergeometric, right? But if you take the whole thing from zero to n, it is hypergeometric. But by mixing it with a non-differentiable operator, the whole thing gets clogged. And all these years, since Cox Ross Rubinstein, it had been thought that, huh, uh, convergence is a matter of Asymptopia. And now we know it isn't. It, it is not, not going to converge, and I, do, I, I promise to Zoran I wouldn't bring anything controversial. So within I'll tell you my conjecture why it doesn't converge. It, it might blow your brains a bit, uh, but it doesn't converge uh, because it doesn't converge. I mean, when you hit uh, the hypergeometric lattice with a payoff function that is arbitrary, things go very wonky. And by using infinite precision, um, we invalidated any hope that uniform convergence can be uh, assured. As you know, in mathematics, uniform convergence is very important. Like the idea of a, of, of a uniform condition, like the Lipschitz condition. A uniform continuity, uh, absolute continuity. These notions are not there when you hit an operator that no longer satisfies the wilf Zeilberger pair. So I, when I bought A equals to B, I, 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 was, I must say I was very intrigued. But thank you for assigning it for me. It's a beautiful book, and more importantly, it was forwarded by a very 
great uh, thinker, Donald Knuth. Uh, and, you know, unlike Don, uh, Don responds to email, whereas Don doesn't. He responds to snail mail. So I, I hope that none of you will go back to snail mail. Now, I also sit on an, an, another journal, Journal of Futures Markets, on the board, and there must be about three or 400 papers that have published, been published on the lattice models. So in other words, they've used the lattice approach to take limits as n goes to infinity of the continuous version. Why? Because when you try and solve uh, this sort of uh, equation, you set up a riskless hedge in continuous time. Usually it's a second order stochastic partial differential equation. And usually it's next to impossible to guess the solution. And that's what stymied Black and Scholl for six years, till by luck, a bit like a stroke of luck, they got it because uh, Black decided to do a time reversal. You know, he did a time reversal and it folded down because of dynamic programming. You, you know the uh, value option at the expiration and you can work backwards. And so he transformed t minus t star to t star minus t and lo and behold it fell. What happened was a very, com very complicated stochastic PDE, the simple boundary condition, was transformed to a, another equation which was fairly uh, simple, but had a very complicated boundary condition. But that equation was known to be the heat equation, which had been solved for the last six, six, six 30 years now. And so Black, having an undergrad degree in physics, immediately identified the solution. But how lucky are we in these things? Not often. This case was easy enough because it was a straight vanilla option, a European type. So it didn't have the American option problem. The American option problem is that there's a stopping time problem superposed on the European option that you can exercise it any time before expiration. And that one is known to be, uh, I, I conjecture as NP complete. Although I still cannot prove the other way around. No? That's why the, the proof is timing. David Johnson is uh, waiting for me to finish that part. But uh, there is a paper by Giovanni Baroni Adesi on the saga of the American put. So the American put is notoriously difficult. It's up there. But the European option, are you kidding? People thought it was a piece of cake. After Black Scholes came up, nobody ever queried that it could be done. And this, uh, to me, and Brian, this is very dangerous for me to say it on tape, but I will have to risk my neck now. The fact is that European option was taken for granted that uh, it was a piece of cake after Black Scholes. But then, when you try and dumb it down to elementary formulations, you have a dichotomy between Occam's razor and Einstein's razor. You know, Einstein's razor was KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Sorry, the Occam's razor. Einstein's razor was keep things as simple as possible, but no simpler. I favor Einstein's razor here. If you dumb it down too much, something has got to give. So what has got to give will remain a mystery because although the Zylberger wilf theorem shows that it doesn't converge, and this paper will make it very clear, I'll show you in the graphics, it never converges. The emphasis is taken away from the presumption that as n goes to infinity, everything will fall in place. It doesn't. Can I give an elementary intuitive notion why it doesn't converge? Well, it's like saying that as you zoom in something very, very fine, like in fractal theory, that things would uh, automatically fall in place. Uh, the fact is that at the level of integration that you have in this approach, everything is whole, okay? When you fractionate things and you shrink it down, hoping that the state space would also be shrunk down uniformly. Is it the case that when you shrink this down to a million times its size, things become uh, continuous? So it raises the question which the Greeks raised uh, 2,000 years ago, phlogiston theory. If you keep chopping up something, does it ever become continuous? I think not. So I've been known to ask questions in my PhD exams. Is life continuous or discrete? Mm -hmm. And people who bet on continuous, I, I smack them hard because I don't believe so. I think life is discrete. So in some sense, the zeilberger wilf theorem is applicable to a lot more settings. And you know, Doran, when I heard that it had been used to prove Avery was right, that was one thing. But here, you could have another powerhouse uh, idea coming up, which is that the lattice doesn't converge. And most of the option pricing uh, approaches in finance have been latitio. Why? Because this thing doesn't fall. The, the continuous time formulation uh, doesn't oftentimes work for uh, for very complicated. So options. today I am a little bit puzzled. So, but this model is correct as it doesn't converge. So it's very possible that the right model is a discrete one, and you have to chuck the continuous. That is the sixty-four dollar question. Yeah. Which one is right? So I will take the discrete one. I like to think it's like this. Right now we have a decision there. 
there are about 11 models that have been surveyed. And if you email me, I will send them to you. And no one knows why they don't converge. They've gone to multivariate extensions. Like Hawaii is a big one. So about conversion? Does take N? Because they, they, they steep it in very high-powered math, yeah. thinking that a reader would... Uh, but there's so, there's, there's so little issue with its converges. As far from a practical point of view, today with computers, you can just use a discrete model and take N extremely large, but large enough. Uh, but it doesn't converge. That, 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 that's the beauty of it. It doesn't converge. And that's why I need to go to the graphics a little bit, because we push the computer... But it doesn't even converge in the sense of Cauchy, that if... That, forget about the black shorts. If you say it N, and you go from N to N plus 100, you don't get something close? No, in fact, you get an explosive prevaricatory pre explosion of, ah. of an oscillatory type, which only, only was picked up in 2009 by these guys in Taiwan. Mm. And this theorem that you have uncovered actually shows that a lattice doesn't ever go to the Lee Ito lemma, which brings up the question you raised, which one of these do you pick then? Now, most people would then say... No, my, my question is, if you forget about the Ito lemma, forget all about continuous probability theory, and you just stick to the discrete mess, discrete model that came way after, and take it as the basis, and track everything uh, in continuous. If you take n, uh, a million, and then n, two million, do you get something no. close? No. Ah. There is no close one. Okay. So it's like a boat going nowhere. Yeah. I want to talk a bit more about that, about uh, similar howlers in math, which is unfortunately so deep that people in finance don't follow. That's why I, I'm proud to be here, because you guys follow it. I can, sen I can sense that every word is being lapped up. I give the same seminar in Kent State, all the business school types come. They don't follow it. And so I'm, a, in a way, a little intimidated that Zoran himself is here because you, you actually open these can of worms, you know. The lattice doesn't go here. So the question that you raised is the most correct one. Which one is better? And I know I'm on camera, so people will hear me out. Uh, it just so happens that the alibi here is that this method is frowned on because the, the equation setup is too complicated to solve. But this method is used for all exotics because once you let the computer take over, it, it should converge. And that's why it's very important to know the root cause of it, which I'm not telling at this lecture, because I, I want to wait a bit, bit more. I think I know what's, what's, the, what's the stymieing block. But let me ask a question if I can to the audience. How many of you would vote for this type of formulation? No, that's discrete. I'm not a continuous guy. And this is Dmax, right? Discrete. Yeah. Hmm. This is not Cmax. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think it one works in practice. <laughs> Uh, this one actually is the correct one, if it's corrected. Okay. I happen to know the correction, but unfortunately I'm not telling yet. Yeah. Uh, over dinner I might talk a bit about it, but the fact is that this one, if it's corrected properly, and that's why the paper I find by Evangelos, uh, prompted by the Zalba, the result, is so powerful, because if this one is corrected, it can go through. This one, I'll tell you why I've got a problem with this. When you have continuous time, you're believing that things are continuous. Uh, when you believe things are continuous, you are, have to ask the question, is it the case? If you look at, say, uh, in, uh, uncountable infinity, uh, the transcendence, there's always a discreteness about them that is not in uh, uh, Brownian motion. In Brownian motion, you can always interpolate between two points. And there's a Brownian upper contact, lower co contact escape problem that has timing the thing. And I'll jump to the last page where I brought up a theorem by Gigman and Skorohot in the 50s, and then Harold Kushner and Ed Brown in the 70s, where they made a provocative comment that Markov chains converge to diffusions. This is the Markov chain, discrete time. Okay? Not, not a continuous time version of Markov chain, but a discrete time. They say it converges. They use a very fancy Borel subset theory, measure theoretic, very fancy, but it's wrong. Because in some sense, the, the, the discrete lattice, no matter how you generalize it to a multivariate version or even to a very, very fancy uh, um, Markov chains, the fact is that it doesn't converge. And he, this is what I feel could be the next big breakthrough, that if it doesn't converge, then what do you choose? The continuous time formulation or the discrete time formulation? My preference is to go for the discrete time, if you can fix it. So in other words, Doran has brought up an uh, issue which now needs to be fixed. That if you can fix this problem, uh, this is the correct way. Because most lattice models, as published in journals that publish derivatives, 
use it like this approach because it's easier to set it up and let the computer take over. I remember that in the mid 90s, I would let the computer price exotic options using this this discrete lattice. Although those days were at 65 uh, uh, megahertz, it would take a whole afternoon to get a single value. Today, running at 4 gigahertz, I get it in, almost in real time. So the computing power, you wonder, you know, whether if it's harnessed right, will make the problem go, go away. It doesn't. So analytically, we need to figure out which one are we going to use, continuous time or uh, discrete time. And as this is Dmax, I'm saying it's, it's discrete time. Um, uh, why do I have a pension for discrete time? I've got to tell this joke, uh, Doran, because it is so relevant. There was a book uh, uh, written in 1920 by Ray Cummins, science sci-fi book. It was called The Girl in the Golden Atom. Uh, here was a guy who invents a microscope that can magnify something a million times. He looks through it. He looks at his mother's time, a gold, gold ring and finds a beautiful woman as an atom. And he falls in love with her. So in order to meet her, he shrinks himself to atomic size. Don't ask, it's a sci-fi, okay? And finally, when he meets her, he realizes there are things in the atoms. And as he transcends towards the atomic size, a lot of things happen, like, like here, that he finds that in a gold ring, you got a lot of golden atoms. And they have their own meaning in a very reduced sense. But when he actually meets her, it is the case that she's not a continuous glob of protoplasm. No? Mm -hmm. She's an atom. She's an atomic size girl. So I always told myself, I want to make a movie called Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, but to atomic size. Mm -hmm. So if you shrunk things to atomic size, uh, I think what you will find is that things don't become continuous. They don't become gray goo, no, as they call it in nanotechnology. They remain discrete. Cups don't become half cups, they remain full cups. So this is a very interesting philosophical discourse, which we can get into, but let me just, uh, if I have uh, some time after this uh, discussion on the uh, thing that came up here, say a few things about the graphics. Because uh, for a long time it was assumed that um, things would uh, be hunky-dory and you wouldn't have a problem with convergence. And this is actually a classical problem going back to the central limit theorem, where it is assumed that as n goes to infinity, things go, the sample mean goes to the, to the normal. It doesn't. Now this is something which I have found, I have made enemies in bringing up even uh, to people like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Brad Effer. Because Brad Effer is a man about uh, uh, assuming that things are random. So the randomizability versus non-randomizability debate continues, you know. In computer science, it's called NP versus P conjecture. Now, let me just say a few more things that are very important to say. So if I can turn, turn your attention to the graphics, I, I, I just want to make it clear how this problem is. Now, in the graphics, we uh, we tested these things. One is the oscillatory convergence. It's very slow. And this has only come up in the last few years. And the basic problem is this issue of uh, approximating a continuous payoff function by a discontinuous payoff. Over here, by having a discrete sum go to a continuous integral, that's the problem. So we can say up front that a binomial lattice does not converge because of a theoretically rigorous result. And this one I'm taking from the book A equals to B. It's not hypergeometric. The hypergeometricity is lost, it's clobbered by this function. This by itself is okay. It's this thing here, which is a critical part of splicing two series that causes a problem. And this goes back to Gosper. I don't know how Gosper got tied in, but that's, that's history we'll discuss over dinner. And then uh, Petkov, Sack, your friend, and uh, Wilf and the, the guy. So we, 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 we rapidly bought the books, and I usually like my books to be autographed by the author. I got it autographed. Now, we have to uh, just be a little bit nitpicking here. What do we mean by closed form? Closed form here, if I look at Wikipedia, is an expression of the bounded number of elementary functions. So for example, uh, the famous, uh, I, I like the nightmare version you gave, uh, Doran. If I can just quote that for a second. Because Knuth, Don Knuth made a very big deal about it. So let me write this out in your honor. I, I mean, he made a very big deal in the book Concrete Mathematics. That if you try to sum minus 1 to the n plus r plus s, n choose r, 
n choose s, n plus r choose r, n plus s choose s, 2n minus r <coughs> minus s choose n. Now, if you set this for a comps exam, the students will get blocked, okay? Until his result came, which by using a computer package, it boils down to a very simple expression, s plus 1. It's sum of n to the